Chapter seventy six of Women in History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Bradshaw. Women in History by Anonymous. Chapter seventy six. Madame D'Arblay. Born seventeen fifty two. Died eighteen forty. Macaulay. The daughter of Dr. Burney deserves to have the progress of her mind recorded from her ninth to her twenty-fifth year. When her education had proceeded no further than her horn-book, she lost her mother, and thenceforward educated herself. Her father appears to have been as bad a father as a very honest, affectionate, and sweet-tempered man can well be. He loved his daughter dearly, but it never seems to have occurred to him that a parent has other duties to perform to children than that of fondling them. No governess, no teacher of any art or of any language, was provided for her, but one of her sisters showed her how to write, and before she was fourteen she began to find pleasure in reading. It was not, however, by reading that her intellect was formed. Indeed, when her best novels were produced, her knowledge of books was very small. When at the height of her fame she was unacquainted with the most celebrated writings of Voltaire and Molière, and, what seems still more extraordinary, had never heard or seen a line of Churchill, who, when she was a girl, was the most popular of living poets. It is particularly deserving of observation that she appears to have been by no means a novel reader. Her father's library was large, and he had admitted into it so many books which rigid moralists generally exclude that he felt uneasy, as he afterwards owned, when Johnson began to examine the shelves, but in the whole collection there was only a single novel, Fielding's Amelia. But the great book of human nature was turned over before Fanny Burney. A society, various and brilliant, was sometimes to be found in Dr. Burney's cabin. Johnson and he met frequently, and agreed most harmoniously. One tie, indeed, was a wanting to their mutual attachment— Burney loved his own art, music, passionately, and Johnson just knew the bell of St. Clement's Church from the organ. They had, however, many topics in common, and in winter nights their conversations were sometimes prolonged till the fire had gone out and the candles had burned away to the wicks. Burney's admiration of the powers which had produced Rasselas and the Rambler bordered on idolatry. Johnson, on the other hand, condescended to growl out that Burney was an honest fellow, a man whom it was impossible not to like. Garrick, too, was a frequent visitor in Poland Street. That wonderful actor loved the society of children, partly from good nature and partly from vanity. The ecstasies of mirth and terror which his gestures and play of countenance never failed to produce in a nursery flattered him quite as much as the applause of pure critics. He often exhibited all his powers of memory for the amusement of the little Burnies, awed them by shuddering and crouching as if he saw a ghost, scared them by raving like a maniac in St. Luke's, and then at once became an auctioneer, a chimney-sweeper, or an old woman, and made them laugh till the tears ran down their cheeks. Fanny's propensity to novel-writing could not be kept down. She told her father she had written a novel, Evelina. On so grave an occasion it was surely his duty to give his best counsel to his daughter, to win her confidence, to prevent her exposing herself if her book was a bad one, and if it were a good one, to see that the terms which she made with the publisher were likely to be beneficial to her. Instead of this he only stared, burst out a-laughing, kissed her, gave her leave to do as she liked, and never even asked the name of the work. The contract with Lowndes was speedily concluded. Twenty pounds were given for the copyright, and were accepted by Fanny with delight. Her father's inexcusable neglect of his duty happily caused her no worse evil than the loss of twelve thousand pounds or fifteen thousand pounds. After many delays, Evelina appeared in 1778. Poor Fanny was sick with terror, and durst hardly stir out of doors. Some days passed before anything was heard of the book. Soon, however, the first accents of praise begin to be heard. The keepers of the circulating libraries reported that everybody was asking for Evelina, and that some person had guessed Anstey to be the author. Scholars and statesmen, who contemptuously abandoned the crowd of romances to Miss Lydia Languish and Miss Suki Saunter, were not ashamed to own that they could not tear themselves away from Evelina. 
after producing other novels for one of which camilla she is said to have received three thousand guineas and encountering many strange vicissitudes madame d'arblay died at the age of eighty-eight End of chapter seventy six recording by jenny bradshaw